So I'm going to get started here. Um, I noticed I hadn't opened up Unit 5, so you should. You might have to refresh to see Unit 5 on Brightspace, so make sure you do that. Um, unit 5 will be similar to other units uh, here. So just a quick reminder, uh, we'll have an exercise, and we'll largely do that today in class. Uh, here, we'll walk through a bunch of that stuff. Um, there's a, a learning activity. And starting next week, we'll get into cloud stuff. So I've been trying to get you prepped for some of the cloud stuff we'll be doing. Uh, so we'll, um, at times, we'll, we'll remote or we'll treat our Raspberry Pi like a cloud. So we'll use our computer here and then connect up to our Raspberry Pi rather than wiring our Raspberry Pi up to a monitor directly. We will uh, kind of have the Raspberry Pi on its own. And we'll compare that to some of the cloud objects and we'll go through some of the cloud things. We'll set up a virtual machine on the cloud and compare that to our Raspberry Pi and see how we can uh, use kind of the same sort of interfaces to connect to both uh, and work on it. Um, now with these, again, I want you to spend uh, some time on them each week. Um, there are three options, um, three popular, and again, these aren't the only three, these are just the three I chose. Uh, my, cloud services, Microsoft, Azure, Google Cloud, and AWS. AWS is probably the biggest competitor out there. Um, and um, we have these um, tutorials. I, again, I expect you to spend like 45 minutes to an hour each week on these. So I've been trying to break these up. Uh, like this is a three hour one, this is a eight hour one, and this is a four hour one. I've been trying to break them up into smarter, smaller parts. So like this one, I had it, the unit three, We you could do this first one, unit four, this one, unit five, this one. My kind of assumption is most of you will pick one of these and do the next component each week as we go through it. If you want to switch around and jump around, that's fine. But that's kind of the plan is that you can do it. Now, one, these are all from these different um, learning plans or badges or whatever. And if you go through the whole ones, you'll have completed this, you know, eight hour tutorial or four hour tutorial, AWS cloud practitioner sort of stuff um, that we'll be looking at. Uh, so that's kind of the idea here is to get you um, doing some of that stuff. And again, we'll, we'll, Right now, it just seems like extra. Like, why is he having us do this? This doesn't have anything to do with the book right yet. Uh, but it will It will bring it into our Raspberry Pi and our other stuff and our book in a little bit once we get. So that's why you have the basics there. So you do the, that, and then you do a lab. Um, I'm still updating the lab. Uh, and so by Thursday, it should be updated uh, here. Uh, so don't start the lab before Thursday. Uh, for it. So we'll do that in class. So again, today, just go to the exercise and open the exercise up, and we'll start working on that as we, as I talk through some of this material. Um, and again, we'll be going through unit four of the textbook today. Uh, so that's listed in your readings. Um, so let's start started on this. So basically, we're trying to look at, we kind of started with the CPU and how it's made up of an ALU and the circuitry, low-level stuff in a CPU uh, there. And now we're trying to look at things connected to the CPU that make up a computer system and kind of moving one step away from the CPU uh, for that. Um, so the first thing and probably the closest thing to the CPU is memory uh, here. And we're going to look at memory. Uh, and then we're going to look at storage space uh, for things. Um, and again, when we talk memory, we talk, usually talk two things. And this is your first question, volatile versus non-volatile 
uh, things. Um, and I guess I hope we've all experienced this, unfortunately, is that you're working on something and the power goes out and you lose whatever is in memory or whatever in volatile memory, it goes away. So whatever you haven't saved that you probably haven't experienced it as much as I have because you, you know, are probably used to a lot of systems that save automatically. So Word and stuff save things. Yeah. When um, there used I saw a video of like there used to be this um when they moved from DDR3 to DDR4 RAM. Uh, there was a company that like made a PCI PCIe expansion slot kind of card. They plug all your old RAM so it looked like a hard drive. Really? Yeah. Wow. And then it had like a special battery. So, that it... so, yeah, so because it needed some sort of continuous power to keep it on. Interesting there. Yeah, but I, I have worked places where, you know, before the days of automatic saving, and I remember being, you know, in the work environment with cubicles or whatever, and then the power hits. And everything's locked, you know, and you're just everyone you you could hear the people groan, people haven't, you know, that came in at eight o'clock that morning and worked for five hours and have not saved once, and just five hours of work is just gone uh there. Uh so I, I and I've certainly I've certainly lost uh at least five hours of work or something like that uh on an unsafe stuff. So volatile, non-volatile, uh it depends on you know, again, the hardware used. Or the technology, you know, like you know, sometimes you can use volatile memory, and if you keep electricity, keep some battery up there, you can do it. But a lot of times, it's just how it's written uh, to it uh, there. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about storage and stuff, and I try to give you an impression of how much storage has changed. Uh, in 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 the last 50 years uh here so you just you have an appreciation i mean of you know you keep on well why didn't they do this back in you know whatever pick 20 years ago put pick 30 years why didn't they do it back then and a lot of it was we just didn't have the storage uh that, or it was very very expensive to do that and storage has really changed how we do things uh today uh, so, um, so I'm going to play uh, this crash course video. Um, I'm going to walk through this or stop. Where are you AI taking your job? You should. Um, so this is from PBS Digital Studios, uh, and it's just a quick, uh, you know, it's 12 minute stuff and I'll stop it and just this is their series this is on memory and storage and it does delves a little bit more into history so I'm sorry for that but for some of us old people it is kind of fun. We've talked about computer memory several times in this series and we've even designed some in episode six. In general computer memory is non-permanent. If your Xbox accidentally gets unplugged and turns off any data saved in memory is lost. For this reason it's called volatile memory. What we haven't talked so much about this series is storage, which is a tad different. Any data written to storage, like your hard drive, will stay there until it's overwritten or deleted, even if the power goes out. It's non-volatile. It used to be that volatile memory was fast. You might want to write that down in your storage. exercises. You yeah, haven't done that already. This distinction is becoming less true, and the terms have started to blend together. Nowadays, we take for granted technologies like this with the USB stick, which offers gigabytes of memory, reliable over long periods of time, all at low cost. But this wasn't always true. <laughs> the earliest computer storage was paper punch cards and its close cousin, punch paper tape. By the 1940s, punch cards had largely standardized into a grid of 80 columns and 12 rows. Okay, I'll stand around some punch cards. If you haven't seen or felt punch cards, you can see them. You can see that at the top is written what the words Actually, it's the programming language. Uh, this is Fortran that's written. Uh, uh, so you see the seed of punches, the send them back and pick them up back there. And I think I mentioned this before. So, like this, Jews talk about this tape. This is how I first learned to store stuff. This is my uh, 1975 program uh, written. 
my eighth try. What the eighth try on it? So I don't need to. Okay. allowing for a maximum of 960 bits of data to be stored on a single card. The largest program ever punched onto cards that we know of was the US military's semi-automatic ground environment, or SAGE, an air defense system that became operational in 1958. 2,500 punch cards, roughly equivalent to five megabytes of data. That's the size of an average smartphone photo today. And punch cards were a useful and popular form of storage for decades. They didn't need power because paper was cheap and reasonably durable. So when I was in high school, we had punch card. We we were taught punch cards in computer classes. That's that's how old punch cards are. Uh, there in our high school, we and that was they were training us to do punch cards because that was where the jobs were. The you know. Well, it was getting a little old at that time, but that was still, we had punch cards uh, and uh, punch card readers and punch punchers, and we would uh, learn to do that in high school. Durable. However, punch cards were slow and right one, so you can't easily punch a hole. So they were a less useful form of memory, where a value might only be needed for a fraction of a second during the program's execution and then discarded. A faster, larger, more flexible form of computer memory was needed. An early and practical approach was developed by J. Presser Ecker as he was finishing work on ENIAC in 1944. His invention was called delay line memory, and it worked like this. You take a tube and you fill it with liquid like mercury. Then you put a speaker at one end and a microphone at the other. When you pulse the speaker, it creates a pressure wave. This takes time to propagate to the other end of the tube, where it hits the microphone converting it back into an electrical signal. And we can use this propagation delay to store data. Imagine that the presence of a pressure wave is a one and the absence of a pressure wave is zero. Our speaker can output a binary sequence like 10100111. The corresponding waves will travel down the tube in order and a little while later hit the microphone, which converts the signal back into ones and zeros. If we create a circuit that connects the microphone to the speaker, plus a little amplifier to compensate for any loss, we can create a loop that stores data. The signal traveling along the wire is near instantaneous, so there's only ever one bit of data showing at any moment in time. But in the tube, you can store many bits. After working on ENIAC, Epper and his colleague John Muckley set out to build a bigger and better computer called EDVAC, incorporating delay line memory. In total, the computer had 128 delay lines, each capable of storing 352 bits. That's a grand total of 45,000 bits of memory, not too shabby for 1949. This allowed EDVAC to be one of the very earliest stored program computers, which we talked about in episode 10. However, a big drawback of delay line memory is that you can only read one bit of data from a tube at any given instant. If you wanted to access a specific bit, you'd have to wait for it to come around in the loop what's called sequential or cyclic access memory, whereas we really want random access memory where we can access any bit at any time. It also proved challenging to increase the density of the memory. Packing waves closer together meant they were more easily mixed up. In response, new forms of delay line memory were invented, such as magnetostricted delay lines. These delay lines used a metal wire that could be twisted, creating little torsional waves of represented data. By forming on the wire into a coil, you could store around a thousand bits in a one foot by one foot square. However, delay line memory was largely obsolete by the mid 1950s, surpassing performance, reliability, and cost by a nuclear arms block, magnetic core memory, which was constructed out of little magnetic donuts. If you move the wire around this core and run an electrical current through the wire, we can magnetize the core in a certain direction. If we turn the current off, the core will stay magnetized. If we pass current through the wire in the opposite direction, the magnetization direction called polarity flips the other way. In this way, we can store ones and zeros. One bit of memory isn't very useful, so these little donuts were arranged with grids. There were wires to select on the right row and column. Could be used to read or write a bit. Here's an actual piece of core memory. I forgot to bring my core memory down here, but I actually have a piece of this, and you can actually see the little magnets, the, the little round donuts, uh, barely visible. You can see them in here that make up that uh, stuff, and that was really common uh, early type of memory uh, for this. In each of these little yellow squares, there are 32 rows and 32 columns of tiny cores each one holding one bit of data. So each of these yellow squares could hold a thousand- Each one of these is a little- In total, there are nine- wrote, bits. Round so donut-shaped magnet. That wrote 1,216 bits, which is around nine kilobytes. The first big use of core memory was MIT's Whirlwind One computer in 1953, which is a 32 by 32 core arrangement. And instead of just a single plane of cores like this, 
It was 16 boards deep, providing roughly 16,000 bits of storage. Importantly, unlike delay line memory, any bit could be accessed at any time. This was a killer feature. A magnetic core memory became the predominant brand of access memory technology for two decades, beginning in the mid 1950s, even though it was typically woven by hand. Although starting at roughly $1 per bit, the cost fell to around one cent per bit by the 1970s. Unfortunately, so one cent per bit, sorry, but expensive, but one cent per bit, not byte, bit. That's eight bits even to a byte. Even one cent per bit isn't cheap enough for storage. As previously mentioned, an average smartphone photo is around five megabytes in size. That's roughly 40 million bits. Would you pay $400,000 to store a photo or core memory? Do you have that kind of money to drop? Did you know the crash course is on Patreon, right? Wait, wait. Anyway, there was tremendous research into storage technologies happening at this time. By 1951, Ecker and Muckley had started their own company and designed a new computer called Unibag, one of the earliest commercially sold computers storage magnetic tape. This was a long, thin, and flexible strip of magnetic material stored in reels. The tape could be moved forwards or backwards inside of a machine called a tape drive. Inside is a right head which passes current through a wound light to generate an electronic field, causing a small section of the tape to become magnetized. The direction of the current sets the polarity, again perfect for storing ones and zeros. There was also a separate read head that could detect the polarity non-destructively. The Univac used half-inch wind tape with eight parallel data tracks, each able to store 128 bits of data per inch. With eight... So if there are eight parallel tracks in your tape, I wonder what we call that sort of eight. Maybe like eight track? It sure, will contain 1,200 feet of tape. You guys don't even know what eight track track is. 15 million bits. We used, to, we used to play music on eight track. Tape drives were expensive. The magnetic tape itself was cheap and compact. And for this reason, they're still used today for archiving data. The main drawback is access speed. Tape is inherently sequential. You have to rewind or fast forward to get the data you want. This might mean traversing hundreds of feet of tape to retrieve a single byte which is slow. A related popular technology in the 1950s. Okay, so have you guys ever had to rewind a tape of any sort? Have you ever done a videotape? Like, or a cassette tape or something? So that's what she's talking about, is this rewinding. I was just wondering if you'd ever, so some of you have rewound something. Some of you may not have ever rewound anything, and that's really sad uh, there, so, okay. 50s and 60s was magnetic drum memory. This was a metal cylinder with a drum coated in a magnetic material for recording data. The drum was rotated continuously and positioned along its length with dozens of reading right heads. These would wait for the right spot to rotate underneath them to read or write a bit of data. To keep this delay as short as possible, drums were rotated thousands of revolutions per minute. By 1953, when the technology started to take off, you could buy units able to record 80,000 bits of data. That's 10 kilobytes. But the manufacture of drums ceased in the 1970s. However, magnetic drums did directly lead to the development of hard disk drives, which are very similar but use a different geometric configuration. Instead of a large cylinder, hard disks use well disks that are hard, hence the name. The storage principle is the same. The surface of the disk is magnetic, allowing right read heads to store and retrieve ones and zeros. The great thing about disks is that they are thin. So you can stack many of them together, providing a lot of surface area for data storage. That's exactly what IBM did to the world's first computer with a disk drive. Okay, so she's, she's gonna talk about the ceramic. So I'm gonna hand out that stuff. I, I like to have these around just so you can see and feel the size of these. Cause sometimes you, you know, when you're playing with these little storage like this, you don't get a really good idea of how big this is. So you'll see about the, this is just one of these disks here, so I'm going to hand this out. So my father-in-law went to World War II, was part of a fighter, a bomber, and he learned to do radio operations with well, well, he knew there. Came back to Minnesota, Twin Cities, and knew how to do some circuitry from doing radio operations, and IBM hired him. And so he worked for IBM down in the Twin Cities for many years on that system that could be that's not him because this, but that could have been him back in the 50s uh here uh doing this i remember when i was dating my girlfriend now wife in high school helping him clean out a barn you know you love someone when you're helping their their dad clean out a barn that's that's like the true valentine gift is 
I'm going to help your dad clean up the barn. Inside the barn, he's we're cleaning up the city. He finally finds this box. He goes, oh, you might like this. You like computers. And he pulls out this box and pulls out that disc, which he had stolen when he left. It's been used. Uh, IBM and had it around in his barn. Uh, so forever. So that's it. Ramat 305. Sweet name, by the way. It contained 50 24 inch diameter sticks, offering a total storage capacity of roughly 5 megabytes. Yes, finally, we've got onto a technology that could store a single smartphone photo. The year was 1956. To access any bit of data, a read write head would travel up or down the stack to the right disk and then slide in between them. Like drum memory, the discs are spinning, so the head has to wait for the right section to come around. The RAMAC 305 can access any block of data, on average, in around six tenths of a second, what's called the seek time. While great for storage, this was not nearly fast enough for memory, so the RAMAC 305 also had drum memory and magnetic ball memory. This is an example of a memory hierarchy, where you have a little bit of fast memory, which is expensive, slightly more medium speed memory, which is less expensive, and then a lot of slowish memory, which is cheap. This mixed approach strikes a balance between cost and speed. Hard disk drives rapidly improved and became commonplace by the 1970s. A hard disk drive like this can easily hold one terabyte of data today. That's a trillion bytes. Okay, yeah, so here's another generation of hard drives. I also have some, but again, you can see, she's talking about the different read heads. You can see the different read heads, and then they have these, uh, there's different platters in here, and they're all two sided one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight platters uh, here, and they're all two sided. Uh, and then they have these read heads that will go back and forth in it uh, here. This is from a Sun Spark station from the 90s. So this was one gigabyte. She's talking about terabyte. Yeah, we have terabyte drives, but this is one, this is one gigabyte back in the day, so a thousand times less. Than that. Bytes are roughly 200,005 megabyte photos. And these types of drives can be bought online for as little as 40 US dollars. That's 0 0.0000000005 cents per bit. A huge improvement over poor memories, one cent per bit. Also, modern drives have an average seek time of under 1 100th of a second. I should also briefly mention a close cousin of hard disks, the floppy disk, which is basically the same thing, but uses a magnetic medium that's floppy. You might recognize it as the save icon on some of your applications, but it was once a real physical object. It was most commonly used for portable storage and became near ubiquitous from the mid-1970s up to the mid-90s. And today, it makes a pretty good poster. High identity floppy disks like zip disks became popular in the mid-1990s. So this was my core thing in college. We used floppy disks all the time. Uh, they could store up to 300K, up to 1 meg uh, here. There. They are floppy kinds of, and this this looks like a hard one. You're saying similar to how, but inside the actual thing inside of it is floppy, is flexible, so uh, stuff. But we used to, we used to. I when I first started teaching, students would turn these in. I had a box, and they'd have their names on, and they just this is how they turn in their assignments uh, is on floppy disks uh, when I first started teaching. All Mac computers. Oh, I'm just all Mac. Seventy-two in the form of a twelve-inch laser disc. However, you're probably more familiar with its later, smaller, and more popular cousin, the compact disc or CD, as well as the DVD, which took off in the nineties. Functionally, these technologies are pretty similar to hard disks and floppy disks. But instead of storing data magnetically, optical disks have little physical divots in their surface that cause light to be reflected differently, which is captured by an optical sensor and decoded into ones and zeros. However, today, things are moving to solid state technology. Okay, so, do you own a floppy disk or anything that you play? I mean, a, a CD, anything optical or a movie, do you own stuff? So what do you own? What do you have uh, that's on a disk? Give us some examples. We have a uh, bookshelf full of DVDs. But DVDs and are Blu-ray, so. And you have a Wii, too. Some Wii games are on these, right? Okay, that was a nice class. Other examples? Anyone have music? Anyone have CDs? Some of you still have CDs around? My PlayStation. 
this should replace it. Yeah, yeah very good. Nice. Right. Yeah. So um, this is uh so there were two different, I mean, CDs came in, they, they looked the same, but they were two different, slightly different architectures inside. Uh, one was for the computer and one was for audio here. So this is a computer CD uh, from the 90s, 600 meg. And again, it's similar to an audio CD, but again, the, the, the structure of the tracks were slightly different. So we couldn't use them necessarily interchangeably sometimes, depending on what era they were. Um, I remember when we took our whole big stack of CDs and digitized or they were all in, in converted them all onto what our iPods onto. So, you know, basically all, you know, a whole big stack of these onto one thing like this. And and doing that. And um right now, yeah, we don't. Someone gave me, well, I was talking to someone and they, oh, I'll give you, I'll give you the, the movies, uh, the, you know, Blu-ray so you can play it. And I looked at us, we don't have anything in our house to play or even have, use us anymore. But then we realized that I still have a, a, an external USB uh, CD player that that I we plug in so we can still use it. So I still have one thing that can play. But this was really um, popular. So what we how about what versions of the PlayStation? When what games were on these? PlayStation, PS2, and Xbox. Which yeah, Adam. So okay. Now I'll go to solid state. Oh, Oops, oh, I keep shocking this. The integrated circuits, which we talked about in episode 15. The first round of integrated circuits became available in 1972 at one cent per bit, quickly making magnetic core memory obsolete. Today, costs have fallen so far that hard disk drives are being replaced with non volatile solid state drives, or SSDs, as the call kids say. Because they contain no moving parts, they don't really have to see anywhere. So SSD access times are typically under one one thousandth of a second. That's fast, but it's still many times slower than your computer's RAM. For this reason, computers today still use memory hierarchies. So we've come a long way since the 1940s. Much like transistor count and Moore's law, which we talked about in episode 17, memory and storage technologies have followed a similar exponential trend. From early core memory costing millions of dollars per megabyte, we've steadily fallen to mere cents by 2000 and only fractions of a cent today. Plus, there's way fewer punch cards to keep track of. Seriously, can you imagine if there was a slight breeze in that room containing the Sage program? 62,500 punch cards. I don't even want to think about it. See you next week. So, um, in your exercise, let's talk about some things. Uh, I want you to describe three types of early storage. Uh, if you need to go back and watch the video uh, here, just do a quick description. Uh, note the capacity and the years used, or feel free to look them up uh, somewhere else and put them in here also. So, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about memory here, which we started talking about RAM. So this is volatile memory uh, for this. Um, early ones back again in the 40s and 50s were electromechanical relays. So what does electromechanical means? It means that it was an actual mechanical switch moving. And you've probably heard the story of Grace Hopper's lab on the ENIAC and a moth getting caught in the mechanical relay, that being one of the first bugs there. Also, the program wasn't working. So they were going through checking all these mechanical relays, and someone found a bug. And there we go, there's Smithsonian. It's often on display uh, at, at the Smithsonian. I forget what museum it's at there. but. Uh, the the notepad because they just took that bug and taped it in and said this is the bug we found uh, here so that's mechanical sort of stuff uh, we mentioned core memory uh, here and then we're getting up to this RAM memory and we'll talk a little bit about the formats of that and what we're seeing now 
uh, here. So again, this is this RAM memory, uh, and they we've moved now to putting them on these uh, chips. Sometimes called SIM SIMs or whatever, and there's different uh, generations or versions of this uh, here. Um, and so we've we've seen evolution over time. So like so like this is early stuff. This is uh 256k uh here. So not even a meg of RAM on one of these cards uh for this. So early computers, I remember pulling that, those in and out of early computers. Um then we were moved to this generation. Of and again on this you might call this DRAM uh 80s, 80s uh here or, or SRAM sort of stuff. And um we've looked at some different versions of it. So uh so I want you to go through this and look at this history and see if any of this you've used uh any of this memory. Uh, use and where uh, there. So um, you might want to look up some of your devices and what kind of memory they had. And you can also ask AI to help you with that uh, here. So again, um, think back, what's the earliest gaming console you had? You might want to look up what kind of memory was on that. Or uh, did you have an early iPod? What kind of memory was in that uh, stuff? Um, early computers, if you can remember an early computer you had uh, for that. So if you can think of any of these devices, any device, and look, um, I've certainly used devices uh, with all of these memories. I never used anything with core memory uh, for that. So. Um, I don't think I use anything with with actually a semiconductor memory because we we had chips memory chips even when I started. So and the next thing we want you to do is look at DDR memory. So again, um, we had SRAM starting in the seventies uh, uh, here, and then we moved uh, to dynamic uh, RAM and double rate dynamic RAM here uh, for this, where we're reading. A lot of this comes from just engineers trying to figure out how to optimize reading data through stuff. And so one of the things they learned, so again, you remember when we were looking last week, we had this clock circuit and the clock would go on and off and then we'd go up and down and up and down. And what they learned at some point is they were writing data on every upbeat, but they learned they can write data on upbeat and a downbeat and an upbeat. So by a lot, one of the doublings was simply learning that you could write data on both the the both parts of the clock going up and going down for this. So, um, so here's a little history of DDR RAM uh, here. So. Uh, DDR3, I'm starting there, was 2007. I thought that's about as early as you probably have seen or worked with computers with uh, here. Um, and it, you know, we had capacities up to 16 gigabytes per DIM uh, module here. Uh, lately, we've been using DDR4 memory since 2014. Uh, here, it's been very common. Um, I, I don't know, I've never used DDR5 memory. Uh, it's out there. I don't know if any, if you're building a new computer with a new motherboard. And so one of the things you have to watch is that the whole, the if you're building a computer, working with a computer, uh, it, you know, the clock, the processor, the, the memory talks to the CPU, CPU talks to the processor back and forth at a certain clock rate. And it all has to be built at a certain level of DDR. So if you have a motherboard or a computer 
uh, and a processor that's built for DDR4, you can't just put DDR5 in it or vice versa. This is very specific to you. And because of this, they have different configurations of the pins uh, here. So they'll have these different uh, pins for these chips. Uh, so like this is one we pulled out of a laptop uh, here. And again, they'll have these notches in and the notches will often be at various spots so that you, Generally, if the notches fit, you can put the memory in uh, for that. So that's a good way to tell if the memory is going to work with your devices. Have you, have any of you swapped out or added memory to a laptop? So one of you laptops, is that what you've done? So um, it might be done, just opened them up and swapped out. And were they, did they look pretty much like these? Sizes. Right. So, so yeah, it's still kind of common uh, for laptops uh, to do it. Um, phones don't have generally, and tablets don't generally have. I don't know of anyone of those that have the capacity to add and remove memory. Those seem to have the memory built into the boards because it's again so small. So I guess only a, like a laptop or something like that to doing something like that with. So. Okay, I'm going to, well, let's just finish up with DDR and then I'm going to jump back to the textbook. Um, DDR is actually stored, these, the chips are actually stored, the, the data on the chips are stored actually in memory banks uh, here which allows you to read multiple things at the same time. It's kind of like a hard drive like this. If I have eight platters and then 16 sides, and I have this little read pads of reading a byte, but there are 16 of them uh, here. So I can read 16 bits at a time because you know I have 16 platters for this. Now memory, only if I'm only reading one bit at a time, it's going to slow things down. But if I have 16 memory banks all with the separate circuits, I can read 16 bits at a time from memory, kind of like I can read from these 16 pads at a time. So again, and then when I'm saving data out there, we want to make sure we say, so if I'm writing a byte of data or I, uh, uh, just an integer that's uh, 16 bit, integer, it's actually going to be spread over all of these platters because I'm going to write it, it uh, one bit to every platter at the same time. So when I read it, it'll read very fast. So also, same with memory banks uh, here, uh, where we can have like eight bank groups, each with four banks. And so we can read a whole bunch of data at the same time from that. So that's another way we're optimizing this memory stuff. Okay, so your job, I'm gonna talk about textbook stuff. So your job is to, you can go through and uh, answer these questions if you are tired of hearing me talk about this. Uh, at least do part A, you should be ready to do all of part A of the exercise, so. So in the textbook, we've got, and they talk about at the transistor layer, uh, how we set up this. Last class, we talked a little bit about uh, soffits or these circuits for creating these memory systems. This goes into more detail. We're, we're going to skip all of that stuff uh, here. But again, then we're creating DRAM out of these uh, systems. Uh, and here's a way we're just storing one bit of information in here and then laying these out in a grid to store more information. And eventually this, you know, from DRAM, we're up to uh, different versions that talk about DDR5 uh, here and reading it. Uh, they talk about single rate and double rate uh, transferring of data uh, here and how this works. Um, and again, there's a different generation from DDR1 all the way up to DDR5. I would say we're still kind of in the DDR4 generation uh, now uh, with, you know, DDR5 coming 
Uh, so um, I'm wondering if like if phones and stuff are you uh, what if they're using those sorts of chips with built-in systems. So I haven't looked. Um, there's also special memory for graphics. Uh, so if we're doing some graphic processors or working with that, there's some special memory set up uh, and optimized because uh, a GPU, a graph, and we haven't really talked about what a GPU is. A uh, GPU is you know, a special optimized processor that goes along with your CPU that's just formatted for graphics uh, there. So any sort of like high-end gaming machine, like an Xbox or PlayStation is going to have a, uh, a GPU inside of it driving its graphics. And any, if you're playing a game, um, on a PC, uh, a nice high quality video game, you probably want to have some sort of GPU. Sometimes they're integrated or built into the same chip or same board as the CPU, but so often they have limited functionality uh, here um, for this. But yeah, besides the processor, they have special memory attached to them. So. Um, this talks a little bit about prefetching data and caching data uh, here, trying to figure out, predict what you're working with. Um, we used to talk a lot about uh, also virtual memory um, and your computer system still has some virtual memory in it. Um, if I go here, and if I look at how much memory is on my computer here, it says it has 16 gigabytes of physical memory, uh, but it'll also have virtual memory, 18 gigabytes of virtual memory uh, for this system. Um, and what that means is that when we, you know, right there in the video, I talked about kind of this hierarchy of memory. Uh, here, so memory is on these chips, and it's pretty fast here, but they're expensive. So when you run out of this memory, you're you want to keep running programs. So we pretend we have more of this memory, but we put it on our hard drives. So on your hard drive, there'll be an area set up uh, as memory, virtual memory. So it's slower, and then there's an algorithm that tries to decide what parts of memory should be on your hard drive that you don't use very often and what parts should be actually in memory. And we break memory into what we call pages, sections, chunks, pages, and uh, we page it back and forth. So if you haven't been using mem uh, some memory for a while and then you start using it again, we often have to go to your hard drive, pull those pages off, bring them back into RAM so we can use them. Uh, you, you'll probably notice that sometimes like if you have lots of tabs open or else lots of programs open. Uh, so if I have uh, different things open uh, and uh, I'm running another game or something in the background and I haven't used it for a while, if I switch to that, there might be just a slight half a second delay as that uh, program gets activated again. It's uh, stuff may have been pushed off the memory. I know people who like run their computers and don't ever and just have stuff, you know, applications that are running for like a week at a time. And they started this stuff like a week ago, they ran this program and they just never closed it, never quit it. And then, you know, that sort of stuff probably is out in virtual memory. If you haven't used it for a couple hours, it's probably been pushed out to virtual memory. So again, besides your book doesn't talk about, it talks about this prefetching, but again, there's this whole virtual memory area uh, where we're working with extending our fast RAM onto the slower disk in a kind of best way we can optimize for that. Um,
Let's talk a little bit about disks uh, then. i look at what we... Well, let's go through this part and then we'll, we'll bring in the disks. Okay, IO subsystems. Okay, besides memory, which is close and fast, everything else has to be pulled in to the processor, usually on some sort of connection or bus uh, stuff. And so we have what the book calls the IO subsystem, basically is connecting all these together. Uh, they talk about parallel and serial. We're not gonna deal too much about those. Uh, parallel is sending a bunch of data together. Serial is sending it one at a time uh, here. An example would be like, uh, this is a serial mouse and a serial connection. And then there was just one pin and then the mouse data was set serial over something like this. Uh, where nowadays we, we use a USB mouse when you're sending data over uh, in parallel, well, in a different kind of way uh, there. So it depends on how the data is sent for this uh, stuff. So, um, so let's start about just some of these connections. PC Express. And I, I thought I asked you something about PC Express. Oh yeah, I have this whole thing on command line here. I'm gonna jump to this later. So I'm gonna skip over part B of your uh, of your exercise and I'm down to part C here. So let's talk about the PCI bus. So most most older computers we used to put these cards in to expand them and these one of the main ways of connecting devices to the CPU was this PCI bus uh, here. Uh, so there are different versions of this PCI uh, format and different cards you can add to a computer. So I want you to Google PCI bus uh, and find what a photo of it. So I want you to go out there. Do maybe like an image search or something like that. And there will be these slots and there's actually some different size, but we just want a uh, PCI kind of slot here. Uh, and so find one of those and paste it in here uh, for this photo. And then look for some sort of expansion card. So we would add these expansion cards to computers. I was gonna say this is an ethernet card, but I just realized this is a modem card. So this is when we used to do dial up modems. Uh, used you guys, you ever use modems? Do you ever have to use your phone line for internet? The your one phone line in your house, and that was your only, and you connect it to your computer. Uh, in the old days, that's what we had to use the phone line to get on the internet. And so, um, and we only had one phone in the house, so that was just used there. So this is actually a phone mode, but there there should be more recent versions of these. Uh, a PCI expansion card. See if you can find a photo of one uh, here. So. <laughs> so again, different generations. We're on generation five of PCI stuff. We're sending data much faster back and forth uh, for this. Another type of connection now, particularly for hard drives, is called SATA, uh, S-A-T-A. Um, and most older drives use this. So this is common form factor for a while, a five and a half inch, this is a three and a quarter inch drive uh, here, but they both, the pins here, the connections are basically the same, just the format is different size. So the actual discs are different, but the, these are both uh, SATA drives here that you can plug into this. Uh, and most, uh, well, 
like I think I don't think what, what these have, but a lot of older computers have these sorts of drives in them uh, for this. In fact, the original iPod had this. The reason the iPod was its shape was it was formed right around this this shape of a, a drive uh, here. Um, and then we we generally plug them in right into a computer internally, but like I often am trying to fix people's computers. So I have one of these devices. This is a USB cable and it can, I can just take one of these drives and those pins, I can just plug it in here and it'll take that size or I'll take this size and plug it in. They both plug into the same spot, just like they both plug. Now there's, but I didn't bring one of the cables inside your computer There'll be special cables that'll plug into a SATA drive and that sort of stuff. And so you'll often be able to plug in uh, drives like this. Now, let me scroll down just a little bit. SATA drives were kind of, and that form factor doesn't work very well for solid state drives. We can either one of those, but you can still, for a long time, we did make solid state drives. So again, these are, these two disks have actual platters in them like this, right? And uh, with the original iPods, if you ever like tried to dance with them, not that you just dance well on an iPod, but if you shook the iPod, it would be bad because that would, it would vibrate and it would break up the music. Uh, the Apple quickly moved away from that. Uh, and so now we're in solid state drives uh, here. Um, so this is a, a solid state drive, and but it, it is not a SATA one. It'll say a format on it. It says, this one says M.2. This is M.2 drive on it. Um, and I actually have it here. So this is the drive. Um, so again, if I'm trying to read this, this is just a USB enclosure uh, for that. So I actually have the drive included. So this is the actual drive. So this is the whole hard drive uh, here. This is M.2 format. And again, you can kind of recognize that from, from the pin structure out there. There's another kind of competing format out there that your book doesn't talk about, but your exercise does, and that's the MVME format. So now if you go to Amazon, and let's say you wanna buy a new hard drive for your laptop or some device like that, you've gotta know, it used to be if they're all SATA, then you could just buy them, but now you have to know but to look up your laptop and see, it might have a SATA plug and you might have to plug that in. It might have a SATA M2 plug and you might have to do that. It might have an ME, an MV, an NVME uh, type and you'd have that. I thought I had a, one of those other ones, but then I realized over Christmas, my sister's laptop crashed and she needed a hard drive and not had one, and it was this format, and so it's now in my sister's uh, drive. Uh, so again, there are different formats for these hard drives out there, um, but again, still, you're not going to put in your removable hard drive in either a tablet or a phone currently really can't swap out uh, that technology. So now, sorry, I don't have an Xbox or a PlayStation, stuff like that, but I assume there's still hard drives in both of them? Xbox is SSDs. Yes, I'll say drives, right? So they'll have some sort of a solid state drive in them, right? So, right, because again, those sort of devices, we have this hierarchy of storage, we'll have Mem fast, expensive memory, and then we need something a little slower that it'll maybe a little more permanent out there. Uh, so you usually have some sort of SSD uh, thing out there uh, for that. 
Um, so again, I want you to go on the Amazon or other retailers and find uh, like a, one of these devices and just post what it is. So if I just go to Amazon, And I search for uh, MV, an NVMe SSD card that'll show this. And again, that's slightly different. It looks a lot like this, but this one has two gaps in it. Uh, and the other one only has these, only will have one gap in it uh, here. So find one of these, pick a size uh, here. And so this is a two terabyte one. It's in uh, the right format. So post the link to it, the storage capacity, and the cost here, how much it costs to get one of these. So you don't have to find the cheapest one. You just have to find two. And so I want a, an M2 one and an MVME one. Really? The same seller will have, but the same product. The same product. I have not seen that. Um, so right there. What? NVMe 2.0 and got to SSD. Yeah, interesting. Because I thought, and again, this is, some of this is newer to me. I don't replace hard drives. But I thought this was the format of the pinouts uh, here, and, or this. But I'm wondering if M2 is the technology, and this is is the format. So I wonder if there is a different pinout for that. So, hmm. well, see what you can find and post. I'll look through, and I'll tell you what I find for next class. Um, one thing I just wanted to share uh, with you on solid state drives, uh, and you may have run this into this with um, the old USB stick. So did you at one point carry around one of these in your pocket and score things on your USB drive uh, stuff uh, here? And at some point, did it go bad on you after you've had it for years and years and years? And you wonder, like, I had this, it was working fine for four years. Why did it all, all and all my data is, you can't get it. But of course, you backed it up. So, uh, there. Um, why might those things fail? They have no moving parts. So, I mean, these are easy to tell. I mean, these are get scratches in them. So, or we bump them, and that sort of stuff. Once spent a summer with the student, she wanted to try out how good hard drives were. So for summer research, she bought a bunch of hard drives and she would do different things to them while they're writing to see what would break them. So she would go somewhere to crash and hard drives, throwing them out with the ball and stuff like that. So it was a fun summer uh, stuff. <laughs> um, but Solid state drives, no moving parts. What's to fail with those? And the problem is, is that there is this uh, read-write cycle where we can only do so many reads and writes to a device over time uh, here. So one of the things is this, how we're writing uh, the data here. So we can write the data in different formats or different uh, things. So if we're trying to pack lots of data in there, we write them uh, four bits per cell here. Uh, if we're trying to write less data, we can write one bit per cell. But when we write more data to it, uh, 
the amount of cycles, read write cycles we can do before it crash, before it's not readable anymore, shortens. So uh, if we're not storing much data in it, we can write it 100,000 times. So you're not likely to overwrite your hard your drive 100,000 times necessarily, but um, with these shorter ones, it's less. Now with these external drives, you know how many times you know you certain did you ever plug this in and out of a computer a thousand times? Maybe not. But nowadays with these SSD cop where where your hard drives is that there are areas where your computer is regular, like virtual memory, where your computer is regularly writing to your SSD drive uh, and your operating system might hit that peak very uh, faster than other times. So just be aware that they, I want you to read a little bit of this and fill in this table for these different levels. It's just, it's from here. This second article has this data in it. How many write cycles uh, do these different levels of storage uh, allow for? So. We'll talk about two other connections then. Um, let's do USB. See, let's jump, let's do the textbook USB. So USB is probably your the connector you've used the most because again, phones, tablets, computers are all using USB right now. And it's the standard connection for lots of things. We've been working through different generations. We started with USB 1, then we moved on to 1, 1, 2, and then 3. Uh, we're basically in USB 3, although there are different sub-generations of USB 3 out there um, for this. Um, what you're probably most aware of is the type of connectors on USB uh, here. So, and you, I don't know, do you have a drawer full of different cables with different types of USB plugs in it uh, here? So. Uh, you know, I, we we have a drawer, and yeah, we have the, some of our, our older devices, like a Kindle and stuff like that. Uh, we'll have a whole micro USB, uh, the, the one that's flat on one side and one that's on the other side. Uh, there's most of the stuff we have now is doing USB C, it's kind of rounded on both sides, sort of stuff. <laughs> um, some of the old stuff or bigger stuff will have. Kind of these bigger plugs in it, uh, sort of that. So that's still around in places uh, there. And of course, the standard uh, and like this, the, the standard USB port on that. So your job is to, and again, yeah, uh, find an image that shows the different sizes of USB connections uh, there. Um, Again, there's probably four that I use pretty regularly for different sizes of that. Plus, if you're in an Apple household, we have a more a Android Apple joint household. So Apple has their own connectors. Although Apple now won't moving more and more to USB C for things. USB C, but again. If you don't have a newer one, a lot of stuff like we do, we still have the older Apple connections for USB stuff out there. So find that. And then, so that's the first one here, find an image of that. So again, you should be able to just Google, do your Google search of USB connector types. Find one of these pictures of the different connectors uh, here. I have like this 
is a card reader. What I like about it, it has a, a bigger USB port. It has a USB port. And it, on this bigger part, it actually has this slip out and it has a micro one in it. So it has three different USB connections on it. So I can plug this into almost anything I own, which I really like. Uh, yeah. Okay, besides shape, let's talk color. So the second thing I want you to do is find out something about color. So what do you know about the color of USB ports? So like, and does it, is that important? So like, let's see. So USB-C, well, yeah. So this, a lot of USB colors are black. The port is black here. This one, if you look at it, has blue on it. And same with when we're plugging it in, it has blue. Oh, uh, here, this size has blue also. What does blue mean? Um, and I just got this USB uh, charger with a new tablet, and it has a red plug in both sides. So what is that side? You don't have to worry about that cable. So I'm using that. So, so USB, the blue ones are going to be generally USB 3. Uh, if they're not blue, they're like they're black, they're usually USB 2 ish. So, you, I mean, and most of the stuff you're running now is running USB 3 sort of stuff. So, you should probably generally all your cables should be and everything you connect to. If you look at a back, a back of a computer here, um, the ports of it. There should be some USB 3 ports on this. I don't see any. I don't know if those are USB 3. They're not blue. So, uh, but I'm surprised it doesn't have at least a couple USB ports on that. Um, here. Red can mean different things. What have, you, have you seen a red USB for any reason yet? So this one is for the new high speed chargers on some of the devices. Particularly in Europe, this is getting more common than in the United States. So again, they're, they, they're charging things very fast. So you probably have these different little bricks around uh, right in there. Some of them are more powerful than others. Uh, they often will say how many amps they have on them. So like a typical one will be half an amp. A uh, good one will be one or maybe two amps. Uh, here to power some good device to power our Raspberry Pis. We need three amps to power Raspberry Pi stuff. And some of them uh, to do high speed charging of tablets and stuff will be much higher. And for some reason, when they get to higher speeds, they're talking watts and not amps. Uh, here, uh, but you can. Well, we can learn lots the amps conversions, right? So, um, you know the watts and the volts. That equals your amps. Anyone know how many volts USB runs at? Five volts? So USB will run at five volts. So for 60 watts, divide by five volts uh, here. So that's 12 amps. So that's that's a pretty big stuff. So like just in your house, the circuits in your house that run your whole house are like 15 amps. So this is a pretty powerful charger here. Uh, okay, so search for something. And again, the, the colors I don't think are standard, but something that shows different colors of USB ports and put a picture, even if you just have the blue and the black there, put that there. Last thing we just want to mention uh, is, um, the graphic uh, options. So there are different ports uh, for graphics. What I want you to do is look at your monitor in front of you and find out what ports are on your 
mon excuse me, your monitors uh, here, uh, VGA, DVI, HDMI, what do you have? So. So this is what you see. VGA is this three by uh, like spy plug. Uh, traditional all VGA is still around in a lot of places. HDMI is kind of the smile. It's sloped on both sides uh, here. Um, display port will be square on one side and sloped on another side uh, here. And DVIs will have a bunch of ports and then a little vertical slot here, uh, either with some pins on it or not here. So see what, so whenever you buy a monitor or a TV or whatever, you can look inside that. So like if I look in the back of this, I see a VGA port, I see two HDMI ports, uh, another VGA port, but that's all I see on those on that TV uh, here. And again, on the bottom of this, you'll see the same thing. So just write down what ports are on this sort of stuff. And again, if you're doing this, if you're not doing a class, you want because this is induced on Sunday. Grab if you're doing it at home, grab any monitor or any TV around your house. That you have and just do that one. So I'm fine with that. Um, you also notice, like here, just to give you an idea, these are the port, the different connectors we have up here. So we have a traditional HDMI, and then we have these plugs, these converters to convert it into a micro HDMI, uh, USB C. Uh, and I don't even know what these other two, oh, this is a, a different size HDMI in this one here. I think that might be a Thunderbolt one for a Mac uh, connections. So you can often convert these back and forth with the little converter uh, things. Okay. Now we're done in time. Oh, we better get the command line stuff. Okay, I'm gonna jump back to B. Um, actually, yeah, we're going to try some command line stuff, uh, here. So I'm going to play this, uh, video or these parts of this talking about keyboards and commands. So, I so we moved it. Okay. And we're going to go to 8, 5.30. The type of typewriter that was used for telegraphs, called a teletype machine. These were electromechanically automated typewriters that could send or receive text over telegraph lines. Pressing a letter on one teletype keyboard would cause a signal to be sent over telegraph line to a teletype machine on the other end, which would then electromechanically type that letter. This allowed two humans to type to one another over long distances, basically a steampunk version of a chat room. Since these teletype machines already had an electronic interface, they were easily adapted for computer use and teletype computer interfaces were common in the 1960s and 70s. Interaction was pretty straightforward. Users would type a command, hit enter, and then the computer would type back. This text conversation between a user and a computer went back and forth. These were called command line interfaces. This is how I first learned to play and use a computer in middle school. We had these, we had a computer, well, Minnesota had a computer. Uh, and all the school, on all, most, a lot of schools were connected up to the main this computer that was in Mankato uh, through these teletype lines. And so there was two terminals in our school that we could use and we could run. And again, they were paper driven and you type in commands. And that's 
where I learned to play Oregon Trail is on a stuff like that. I, I wanted to bring, I forgot to bring a picture of my brother uh, there programming it. He was writing a program to predict football predictions, which was even back in the 70s, we bet on Sunday football uh, games. And he thought he could make a lot of money by having the computer predict his football winnings. He did not get rich that way. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so this is this was a thing back in the day, this paper typing uh, of computers. And there remains the most prevalent form of human computer interaction up until around the 1980s. Command line interaction on a teletype machine looks something like this. The user can type any number of possible commands. Let's check out a few, beginning with seeing all the files in the current directory we're in. For this, we would type the command ls, which is short for list. And the computer replies with a list of the files in our current directory. We want to Okay, so we're going to go over some commands here. Your job is to list uh, some of the commands from the video in this B1 area. So the first one was LS, the list out the files. In our secret Star Trek Discovery Cast for CXV file, we use yet another command to display the content. In Unix, we can call cat, short for concatenate. We need to specify which files to display, so we include that after the command. Called an argument. If you're connected to a network with other users, you can use a primitive version of a Find My Friends app to get more info on them with the command finger. Electromechanical teletype machines were the primary computing interface for most users up until around the 1970s. Although computer screens first emerged in the 1950s and were used for graphics, they were too expensive and low resolution for everyday use. However, mass production of televisions for the consumer market and general improvements in processing of memory meant that by 1970 it was economically viable to replace electromechanical teletype machines with screen based improvements. But rather than build a whole new standard to interface computers with big screens, engineers simply recycled the existing text only and type protocol. These machines used the screen, which simulated endless paper. It was text in and text out, nothing more. The protocol was identical, so computers couldn't even tell if it was paper or a screen. These virtual teletype or glass teletype machines became known as terminals. By 1971, it was estimated in the United States there was something on the order of 70,000 electromechanical teletype machines and 70,000 screen-based terminals in use. Screens were so much better, faster, and more flexible, though. Like, you could delete a mistake, and it would disappear. So by the end of the 1970s, screens were standard. You might think that command line interfaces are way too primitive to do anything interesting. But even when the only interaction is through text, programmers found a way to make it fun. Early interactive text-based computer games include famous titles like Zork, created in 1977. OK, we're going to get back to Zork in just a sec. Um, we're going to have you try out some of this um, computer-based interface stuff, and you're thinking, why are we learning something that was used in the 70s? Uh, because it's still used a fair amount today, especially when we're connecting to a remote computer or establishing that connection. We have to we create a basic connection, and then we'll use text uh, into that. Uh, a command line text to set things up. And sometimes that's all we have into certain computer systems in the cloud. So it's not uncommon to set up like an Amazon cloud virtual machine, an AWS virtual machine, and then uh, what we call secure shell into it, connect up into it. And then you just have a command line interface. So uh, we'll be learning some command line interfaces in this class. Uh, like Thursday, we'll spend to learn the command line interface for your Raspberry Pi. Uh, but to start with, let's do the two that are on your computer here. Uh, so first is the DOS command. This is a very old version. If you go down to the little Windows thing and you type in CMD, you bring up the command prompt, or you type in command, that'll bring up the command prompt too. We wanna bring that up. So that'll be this prompt here. So that's the DOS command prompt. The other one is PowerShell. This is a newer, more modern one. So if you type in power and you choose PowerShell rather than PowerPoint, or you type in Power S for PowerShell, you want to get to the Windows PowerShell here. So we want you to try some different commands 
that I'll run on these two uh, versions. We want these open, these up. And I want you to find some different commands uh, here. So for, and they'll often be slight, well, slightly or totally different commands. So like in the DOS prompt, I can type in help uh, and I'll display a help and a list of commands I can do. Uh, and if I want help on a particular command, like there's a command called CD, I can type in help space CD and it'll tell me all about the CD command. So help, and I have that one listed here. In the Windows, Power Windows, I type man, short for manual, and it'll tell me about it. Now this displays one page and it says more. I have to hit a key like space to get more examples here, so. So your job is to find some different commands here and try them out on these different machines uh, for this. So you can do some searching uh, here. Like one thing you could search for like is common DOS commands. for this. Or you could ask for like commands in PowerShell and in DOS command prompt. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, I could type in a command here. And so I'm in a, what we call a prompt. So right now the prompt shows my current folder uh, here, C colon user slash T Gibbons. And again, that you're probably used to seeing that more as a folder point of view. So if I go to my computer, go to C drive, go to the user's drive, and go to T Gibbons, that's the folder. The folder I'm in here is Windows C folder, user folder T Gibbons. And that's the same folder then as I'm in here, C slash colon slash user slash T Gibbons. And if I type in the kind DIR for directory, it'll list all the files and folders in that. And that should match what I see here in this view. Now in PowerShell, again, my prompt is a similar. <clears throat> it says PowerShell and then that and I could try that same command, D-I-R, and it might work. Uh, I can also try a different command like LS to get a listing that either the DRR or the LS will work in PowerShell. If I'm in DOS and I type LS, it will not be recognized. Uh, so your job is to try out some commands in both. And I, what do I want, five commands? Yeah, five, at least five commands uh, here. So like list files in current folder, uh, DIR and in PowerShell DIR works. So does LS, but one of them works there. Okay, so spend a little time trying to research some other DOS commands or some other PowerShell commands and fill them in here.
got to show you this is my favorite new thing. This is a one terabyte and spike rest card. So you know, I got a terabyte of data. It's amazing that in this little thing, I can get a terabyte of data. That's just crazy. But that will still charge you how much money for a to upgrade their iPhone from two fifty six to five dollars. Just give us a slot for this. Okay, and this is all we're doing today. So if you get done with this, you're good for the day. Um, exercise I don't actually do to assemble. Everything's lost sense. So you know, so you don't have to turn it into one go. So you're certainly welcome to. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was through this something. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't here on Thursday night. Right. Raspberry. Okay. Right. Yeah. Do you need access to your Raspberry Pi or when you want to? Yeah. Have it now or? No, I don't. Yeah. Do you want to get it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can get it. Um, it's actually up in my office. Let me go grab yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Let me stop, guys. Right. Exactly. Sometimes you just get bored. Okay. Also, on the, I guess the green one, I couldn't do it. 